Hello, welcome to today's episode of Juice and the Numbers, your statistics and sports podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Tracy. And I am Corwin Heller. Oh, and uh, yeah, we, we missed a couple. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's all right, folks. It's been a busy, it's been a busy year for Corwin and I doing doing stuff and things. Um, yeah, it's just life. But hey, we we are we are we're 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 back, back in the New York groove. Um, back, back in the New York groove. Yeah, uh, and. Uh, figure we just kind of start plowing through stuff. I don't feel like there's too too much um news news type of stuff. But figure we could start with the one thing that definitely feels as though it's been uh an ongoing controversy in the in the sports world baseball world over the past week or so. And that is uh Josh Donaldson and Tim Anderson getting into it. Uh, in New York the other weekend when, or earlier this week, honestly, time is just disappearing from my memory as after what was well, yeah, a, was like four um, days ago, it would have been like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I honestly, it, I don't think I could tell you what data was at this point. I uh, really, truly don't. Um, but after kind of a chippy series back in uh, Chicago, literally two series before the most recent Yankees White Sox series. So it was their, the Yankees schedule as a Yankees fan was a series in Chicago, a series in Baltimore, uh, a series against Chicago at home, a series against Baltimore at home. So they played the same two teams in four straight series. Um, so the first Chicago series, a little bit, um, again, a little bit chippy after uh, Donaldson had kind of like brought his knee down on uh, Tim Anderson during a slide back to third and uh, some of that, that chirping has extended out to this series. So essentially um, the, the, the current, I don't know, honestly controversy because it feels like maybe the wrong word using it again. Uh, but after making an, an out, uh, you know, Tim Anderson making an out, Josh Donaldson referred to him as Jackie during a heated exchange um, in which both sides were barking at each other a little bit. The idea there is back in 2019, Tim Anderson had an article uh, or was interviewed for an article in which he said he felt as though he was today's Jackie Robinson in certain respects. And apparently Josh Donaldson thought that that was ridiculous. So he decided to use it as fodder for making fun of Tim Anderson, which presents kind of a challenge because no one, I I would be hard pressed to say that Tim Anderson thinks that he is doing something as colossal as breaking the race barrier. You can't do that twice. You can hit after Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs. You can hit 60 home runs again. It's been done a few times but you can't re-break the race barrier. And I think Tim Anderson knows that. (laughs) And it's not like, you know, someone hitting 60 home runs or, you know, hitting 75 home runs or 73 to break bonds. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's just a record that is moving up. Like it's literally a record that it's not even a record. It's like a groundbreaking foundational piece of how the league works. And Part of what made it that and part of what carries Jackie Robinson's legacy in the game today. And it's so funny. We're talking about this because we've had a couple conversations in the past, including one on this show with Shakia Taylor, which it's like, don't boil down baseball's entire relationship with race down to just Jackie Robinson. So it's so ironic that that's essentially what this conversation has forced us all to do a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's like, Every black baseball player in MLB has their legacy tied directly back to Jackie in a certain type of way. And when they do anything, they're doing it really, you know, directly or indirectly with a tie back to Jackie Robinson. When someone fights for your ability to do something and they succeed, you then continuing to do that thing is carrying forth their legacy. 
that's the whole idea of trying to break any barrier is that that's what you did. And on top of that, what Jackie Robinson also did beyond just breaking the race barrier and being a very, very good player, one of the MVP, the rookie of the year trophy is literally named after him um, winning a world series. Two, I'm going to stick with one. I only thought it was one. Um, He also did his best to make sure that uh, youth baseball was advanced in the black community and that black baseball players um, of younger ages got a chance to get a foothold in the game which was what Tam Anderson was referring to in his 2019 article. Not he thought like, I am black and I am good at baseball. That makes me Jackie Robinson, which would be some wildly reductionist thinking from a man who I'm sure has thought much harder about who he is in society than that. Um, And so when you boil down really what is kind of a nuanced concept, which is Jackie fought for me, Tim Anderson. He didn't know who I was, but he fought for me. I am carrying on that legacy. And we've talked about Tim Anderson a lot in the past because he has been a bigger figure. He's been a guy who is willing to show a lot of emotion, a lot of personality on the field, which is also advancing the ball game in a much, much smaller way comparatively to breaking the race barrier, but is also advancing the game in a certain type of way to be more accustomed to the, to black expression in the game, African-American expression within the game, but is also carrying on Jackie's legacy in the way that he does it with his youth engagement. Oh, so much backstory. Oh, all right. Sorry, go ahead. When this first broke, the way it seemed was Josh Donaldson had seen this article that had come out, you know, earlier that week or, or, you know, a couple days beforehand. And when I first heard it and, you know, saw everyone reacting the way they initially did, it was like, hold on guys. Like he, he literally called himself Jackie Robinson. Like, yeah. Like if, he just gave this interview. If I read it, you know, sitting on my ass in the clubhouse before the game, it's like, yeah, like I would probably make that joke and think nothing of it, but that was three years ago with nothing even remotely close to, you know, nothing has come up in the past several weeks or months, even that would bring that back to the spotlight to cause something like this to be the first thought when hearing such a thing. This is just a really poorly done attempt at making a joke that is without question racially motivated. Like, I'm not going to call Josh Donaldson racist. I'm not going to say he's a bad person because he made a, you know, ill attempted joke or a joke that, in his mind was appropriate at the, at that point, but my goodness, like you can't, you can't be a functioning member of society in this day and age and not know that that is not something you can say to someone and that that is a bad thing, objectively bad thing to say. Uh, The, yeah, I got nothing. Well, and ignoring ignoring all the backstory I just gave on how Tim Anderson, from my understanding, how he arrived to, to his mindset and you know, blah, 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 ignoring all that for a moment. Let's think about this on the surface, okay? You're trying to rile. I'm Josh Donaldson. I'm trying to rile up the person I'm directly looking at, right? The, my, my opponent in the game, I'm trying to piss them off. Okay. That's what shit talk is. I'm trying to piss you off. Okay. That's my mindset to do that, to accomplish that feat. I'm going to use one of the most well-known names in all of sports and probably the best known black butt baseball player in MLB history. I'm going to invoke the name of a black man to make that other black man feel bad about himself. How wild is that? 
How, like, on its surface, how wild, wild is it? Imagine there was, like, an Asian kid in your class at school or, like, an, an Asian dude at your job, and you just kept referring to them as Kim Jong-un or some shit like that. Well, he was a Yo, bad guy. Jackie Chan. But let's, yeah, Jackie Chan. You know, that's much better. Like, imagine you just refer to every Asian dude you fucking met as Jackie Chan. You know how wildly racist that is? I know people like that. I knew someone who called other people Jackie Chan. Yeah. He was not a well-liked person. No. He was a dick. Yeah. And I bet, and you know what? I bet he was doing it because he thought he was a nice, fun guy. Imagine he he's he doing it. Hilarious. Imagine now, it, now he's it. doing it on purpose, knowing he is trying to piss someone off. That's what Josh Donaldson did. And I think at another level, if this was like a Joey Votto or um, oh, who's the first baseman for the Marlins that was just messing around with the Ozzy Albies? Um, uh, Jesus Santos? No, Jesus, uh, Jesus Aguilar. Jesus Aguilar. Yeah. Jesus Santos was my RA in college. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, if one of them made that joke, like guys who are known and their reputation is of being a fun, joking around, fun loving guy who by all means has a perfectly clean track record, you'd be like, okay, I, I might give them the benefit of the doubt, or I probably would give them the benefit of the doubt because based off of the rest of their surrounding character and all that they've shown about their character. Yeah. It, it probably was a, you know, warm hearted joke or whatever the idiom is I'm looking for. They probably know, you know, Tim Anderson. Well, whatever, like, okay. Like I, I won't jump at their neck, you know, and come after them. But Josh Donaldson is like wildly or well known as, widely being a dick to everyone. He tried to fight Lucas Giolito in the parking lot play. after a game last year. He tried to fight Lucas Giolito, the pitcher of the for the White Sox, in the parking lot outside of the stadium last year. Not a good guy. Oh, God, that's straight out of Happy Gilmore. But yeah, like, that's the thing. If it was... If it was a genuinely an inside joke, which is what Josh mm-hmm. Donaldson is claiming, which you don't have inside jokes with people you don't like, really, nope. it's just bullying that, and they they just keep yep. calling you the same thing, and you don't fight back. Um, but if it was genuinely an inside joke, like if Joey Votto or Jesus Aguilar said something like that, um, chances are it would be in an attempt to diffuse a situation, and uh, Tim Anderson would. Uh, have no problem with that because it would genuinely be be a thing where that they called each other or, you know, or that, you know, like Jesus Aguilar called him Jackie all the time. And they're you know, smiling, yucking it up at first base. And, um, you know, Tim Anderson's getting real hot and, and Aguilar would be like, uh, all right, you know, it's all good. Come on, Jackie. Like, it's all, or some shit like, you know, like where it's like, let you're right. Shit's fucked. It's going to be all right. Like, I got you some shit. Not that, not that you don't get mm-hmm. a rise out of somebody by invoking the name of one, a person who just happens to share a uh, ethnic background with them. Uh, and also someone who would be their hero. Yeah. Not, not what friends do. You know, that person that you idolize and look up to and base your life off of them. I'm going to use them derisively as a fuck you in the middle of a random baseball game in May. <laughs> yeah. Not what a good guy does. Um, honestly, though, thank God he didn't have a beard because that would just be over the line, you know, in this case and, you know, really protecting the Yankees image. Oh, yeah. Which, uh, so what ended up happening in, in, in the fallout of that is MLB opened up an investigation, which seemed to already have been finished because they came down with a one game suspension and a fine. Now to tack onto that, Josh Donaldson is currently on the COVID IL. Um, he got COVID, or at least it was announced he had COVID like literally the day after. Um, so he could have theoretically served this suspension from, I think his IL stint really just like tack a day onto the end. And it's like, all right, yeah, he was just, an extra game. This, this has turned into a, you just are not getting your game check for that day. That, that's really it. Yeah. Right. Uh, but he is instead appealing it, 
which means it'll probably be just fine, which is insane. And I really, from MLB's perspective, this feels like a classic case of, oh, wow, you guys managed to somehow make this worse. Um, because what you what, what MLB is basically saying is, yeah, we acknowledge this was fucked up, but we've decided to name like Kevin Pilar got two games for shouting the homophobic F word slur, like in a random at bat with the Mets back in like 2019 or something like that. And two games was not a lot like that's not a, it's not a big suspension in any way. And if you're going to suspend Donaldson for this, then you have to agree it was severe to some capacity. And if you're going to agree it's severe to some capacity, the only lines on which it could have any severity would be racial lines. And then to issue a suspension that is not very stringent for what you are de facto claiming is a racial uh, incident, it's pretty fucked up. Like, didn't they suspend? Hold on. Didn't they suspend Tim Anderson for more games for using the N-word? Did they? Remember that when that was a story like two years ago or something like that? I don't think I do. Tim Anderson used the N-word in the game, and I want to say they suspended him for saying it on field. And I want to say it was for more games than what Josh Donaldson just got, which would also be wild. Well, honestly, it makes sense because in the minds of a bunch of old white men, uh, a, a black man using the N-word is significantly worse than, you know, making fun of a black man. Let's be real. White on black crime just is not nearly as severe as just a guy hanging out with his friends while being black. Tim Anderson was suspended one game for calling an opposing player in mm. the N-word. Love that. Stupid <sighs> shit. Yeah. It, I mean, it feels a little bit like a story without a conclusion because it's like, well, what do you fucking, what do you want to do now? You know, like, like, all right. You're the Yankees. What are you doing to Donaldson? Um, trade him to, I don't know, the twins for Gio Urshela. Ha ha. Honestly, though, trade him to the twins for Gary Sanchez. Please, for the love of God, I can't watch these Yankee catchers try to play baseball anymore. It's so bad. I can't wait to revisit that trade at, like, the end of the season, next season, literally any point from this point moving forward. It's, oh, God. It's so bad. I know I, we've talked about it a little bit before and it, it yeah. might work out on a rate perspective, but Oh my God, my heart hurts looking at these Yankee catchers play catcher. Um, but for real though, what, what do you think you would do? What do you think it would do? You, you would do if you were. Oh, what I position. would do. Um, I would probably boy. Um, uh, the whole formal apology thing, the whole counseling thing or training thing. Um, I didn't realize I had a drink. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, outside of all the things that would need to be done to kind of educate Josh Donaldson and all the ways that he's an asshole. Um, I think a nice long-term IL stint would be uh, probably the thing that would get to him the best um, as far as, hey, these kinds of things have consequences and you need to do your time and rehabilitate yourself. Um, so, you know, from a team perspective, you don't want to just suspend them because that would just bring more attention to it. I think a long-term IL stint, kind of let it disappear, handle things with Tim Anderson and the White Sox internally and get him to figure his shit out. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I would go to the suspension route rather than the phantom IL 
round because it feels like a little bit more forceful. I think I think going the Phantom IL stint might be a little bit wishy want. So I, I'm gonna go long. I probably go like a week. I do think I go a week suspension. All the training stuff that, that you mentioned. That you know, how much is it gonna work on a dude who's in his 30s and from fucking like Alabama or some shit, wherever the fuck Josh Donaldson's mm-hmm. from, whatever podunk backcountry Nowheresville town that man crawled out of. Um, and I'd also donate. Josh Donaldson's pay for the week he was suspended to MLB's RBI program, which donates money to uh, inner city baseball programs. That's definitely a better idea. Or if Tim Anderson has a charity donated to Tim Anderson's charity that he sponsors. But I think a little bit of a safer, like less that, yeah. con- confrontational one. Because if you do that, it's the Yankees very much so saying, like, we're not siding with you, we're siding with him. And if they want to be a little bit more like, nice about it, I think going with the RBI program would probably be a little bit easier. Yeah, agreed. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Oh, so uh, right now, again, Josh Allison on the COVID IL. So I guess we will wait and see. Um, <laughs> and his suspension appeal thing. Um, Pensacola, Florida. I really thought he was from like the South. Oh, Florida is the South <laughs> at this point, but whatever. You know, the South, South. Yeah. Yeah, no, Pensa. Oh, no, Mobile, Alabama. There you go. Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we'll just keep an eye on it, I guess. Uh, yeah, from, you want to knock out the, the two football topics really, really quick, or do you want to move and save those for the end of the show? Um, yeah, we could do a little quick uh, football. All right. Well, the Pittsburgh Steelers have promoted Omar Khan to take over their GM position. Uh, They interviewed more than a dozen candidates for the job and uh, decided to stick in-house with the candidate and go Omar Khan, who's been with the Steelers for more than two decades. Uh, Mm -hmm. He started off in football operations in 2001 um, and has been promoted to director of football administration in 2011, spent the last six seasons as the VP of football and business administration, which sounds like a hilarious and made-up role. I'm the vice president of football and business. Um, and yeah, so he was responsible for managing the Steelers salary cap in that role. So now as the GM, how do you feel yeah. about the GM change as a Steelers fan? Um, obviously, you know, Colber was, uh, you know, one of the goats, you know, I think he could genuinely be uh, a hall of famer type guy. Um just how much he was able to do for so long. Um, he'll be missed. Omar Khan's been the GM in waiting for what's felt by, you know, at least the last five or six years. He's interviewed with what feels like a dozen other teams, you know, seemingly every season for uh, open GM positions. He's been the mastermind behind contract negotiations and all of these uh, extensions and signings that seemingly always seem to get the Steelers under the cap. They're always able to kind of renegotiate, restructure contracts to get everyone to fit. It's been kind of amazing how well it's worked um, for so long. Uh, so I'm happy he's the guy. Uh, another internal guy, Brandon Hunt, was – Another front runner. He's been one of our, I think he's been a, the head scout, the head of college scouting, um, which has been huge. So this inevitably would kind of foreshadow him moving on in the future. Um, that being said, we also hired an assistant GM, uh, Andy Weidel, Weidel uh, over from the Eagles, who had also um, interviewed for the GM position uh, itself. Um, so I'm very excited for this new front office, you know, new DC, no, new OC, new front office, new quarterback. This is the start of a brand new era for the Pittsburgh Steelers with seemingly the only piece of continuity from the last regime being uh, Mike Tomlin, which by all means I'm, very happy to have Mike Tomlin being that one piece. Um, so this is uh, this is pretty exciting. 
you know, I'm definitely not expecting the Steelers to immediately jump to being AFC front runners or title contenders anytime soon, but there's hope on the horizon. And if being the Steelers, you kind of have to trust that they know what they're doing. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, too. I mean, we're not talking about like the Jets or Jags promoting from within where it's like your organization has been a dumpster fire. What the fuck have you been doing that we're going to trust you with the job? The Steelers have been remarkably consistent. They're mm-hmm. tremendous at drafting, especially within certain specific position groups like wide receiver um, and have been a perennial contender and haven't been under 500 like Corwin's entire life since he was born. Um, that and getting to have Tomlin, it's like, it's like when we talk about, um, mm-hmm. you know, if you have a, a good quarterback can save a, a good coach, or if you have a, like a, a, a rookie, uh, or you have like a young team, but bring in a veteran quarterback, you know, they can kind of, it can kind of help you know, be like a, like fucking Peyton Manning was on the Broncos in 2011, 2012. Um, this feels like that. It's like, yeah, you're going to be GM, but you, you, you have someone that you can lean on that can also kind of help make you look good. You know, like Mike Tomlin can really not just be a voice to help guide Omar Khan, who's also already been in the organization for 20 years and I'm sure knows how it works, but you know, you also got a, one of the most competent head coaches in NFL history. Um, right. that can make almost any roster decision you do probably look at least halfway decent. And if you go through three rounds of interviews with over a dozen guys and it ends up being the guy that you've had been grooming for two decades, it only increases the confidence you have that, hey, this is by all means likely to work out. Uh, yeah, as at Core and I have talked a lot in our in our personal lives, uh, hiring from within usually makes the most sense. Mm-hmm. Promoting from within, I should say, you know, there's people there with some institutional knowledge that if you're a well-run organization, it's probably good to keep around. So, right. yeah, good stuff. Uh, other bit of NFL news real quick. Colin Kaepernick is working out with the Raiders, I think, as we speak um, for a chance at a comeback. Uh, he has not played or, I guess, been on an NFL roster since 2016. So it's been uh, quite a stretch. How much impact he will have should he get signed with the Raiders is to be seen. We've talked a lot in the past year about Derek Carr and how he's been so weirdly, quietly um, um, consistent and, and, and good. So it, it's tough to get move on from a guy or say you're going to draw down the reps of a guy who reasonably is going to throw you 4,500 yards a season with like no issue. Um, but still it great to have cap potentially back in the locker room, uh, back in, back in the NFL, especially given his exit. And it'll be really interesting to see because this, this really I'll promise I'll turn it over to you in a second. Um, this really is like a no-lose situation for the Raiders. So either Cap doesn't, I don't know, have the ability to be on the roster. It's like, all right, well, hey, great PR. Um, or he does, and then let's say he's on the roster and he sucks. All right, well, I mean, we have Derek Carr. Like, we're good. Or he's great, and then you can trade him to a Cuban needy team at the deadline. Um who reasonably just needs a quarterback, whether that be from injury, whether it be the Indianapolis Colts, never settling for one quarterback for too long. Uh, fucking whatever. You know, imagine a world in which the, everyone on the Giants kills it this year except Daniel Jones, a surprise to nobody. Oh, hey, maybe it's like fucking, all right, well, the wide receivers are good. Running back positions playing well. We figured out the offensive line. The defense is up to snuff. Just need a new quarterback. Colin Kaepernick has been playing well in, in, in Oakland. Can't fucking hurt Vegas. They're, they're in Vegas. Um, so yeah, what do you, what do you make of it? It's great. It's a workout, mm-hmm. not a, not a signing, but what do you make of it? Um, I'm glad he got the workout. I'm glad there are teams showing that, Hey, this guy isn't going to be blacklisted. This is, you know, we're willing to bring him in, give him a chance. I honestly don't have high expectations for him to make the team 
because being out of football for what five years be six seasons it's a long time to be out of the league i know he has absolutely shown the ability to play at a high level in the league and by all means he should have been probably a starting quarterback for the past at least from where he was, he should have been a starting quarterback for several more seasons. Who knows if at 34, he would have stuck through and, and maintained that role. But I would love for him to make the team. I will not be surprised if he doesn't make it. And I won't, you know, I won't accuse the Raiders of, you know, stand backing it if he doesn't make the team, you know. Out of is, curiosity, do you know who the second and third string quarterbacks are on the Raiders offhand. Oh boy. So Mariota's gone. Yeah. Connor cook. I imagine is out of the league. Those are the only two backups that I remember for the Raiders. I don't think they would have drafted anybody. I do have here. They uh, they drafted somebody. They drafted somebody. The, their fourth stringer. I did not count him, but yeah. Okay. I see it. I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't tell you a single. All right. Well, um. So their their first backup quarterback is Jarrett Stidham. Oh, okay. They just was last for him. seen. Last seen with the Patriots in 2020. Yeah, they um, traded. They swapped like sixth and seventh round picks. They swapped a sixth for a seventh and Jared Stidham. Like they got him for free. Yeah. On five 13, oh, literally 12 days ago, he got traded to the Raiders, um, which I think really does show that they are QB two needy. Uh, and then behind him is Nick Mullins, who last appeared in the 2021 oh. season for the Browns in one game. Um, and so between the two of these guys, they have played in a combined 28 NFL games, and neither of them played last season. Stidham mm-hmm. not having played since 2020. And I honestly would have to imagine that the ghost of Colin Kaepernick would probably be better than either of them, <laughs> at least from a ceiling perspective. Yeah. Yeah. When you I don't look know at what, it like that, man, that is a tough sell for either one of those guys. I would have, I would much rather see Colin Kaepernick in a game than Jared Stidham or Nick Mullins. That's what I'm saying. It, like the QB two position is kind of odd because you could look at, go ahead. What were you going to say? Who's the rookie? Uh, yeah, I have the rookie here as Chase Garbers. Boy, that's someone I've never heard of. There's no way that man was drafted. That is in undrafted free agent for oh certain. that would actually make sense um yeah he definitely he definitely yeah you know he wasn't drafted he was an undrafted free agent yeah chase chase garbers uh out of corona del mar high school and then cal athletics i don't know what cal athletics is, is it just cal university of cal you you cal I don't fuck. I don't fuck. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. So the QB two position is odd because you could either say we want a high floor, so that we're not getting a guy that could just go out there and lose us a game. We don't need him to win us a game, but we don't want him to lose. You know, we don't want like a Jameis Winston out there where it's like, yeah, he could throw nine hundred yards and seventy touchdowns, or it could be pick six city out there. Who knows? Um, or you could view it as we want a guy that we can gamble on a little bit when our quarterback's out and we got 12 minutes left and we need two scores, you know, that you can look at it either way. And if that's the case, honestly, I have to imagine that both Colin Kaepernick's floor and ceiling are higher than both of these two fucking dudes. But uh, And it's also the AFC West is a bloodbath with oh, the yeah. addressers that are on every single team, the chances of, and cars miss you know, time. The, the chances of a car starting quarterback uh, from that family getting absolutely mauled by sacks is historically very high. Um, 
So if he's out for an extended period of time, you know, it's Vegas, baby. There's a lot of stuff going on in that town. That's not football. The only thing that would really get me to go see a game is, hey, I'll go see Colin Kaepernick sling the ball around. Why not? Yeah, and on, again, if he can be mildly competitive in a very tough AFC West, I th- I think you take it, honestly. It, it's weird we might be talking about the edge of a QB2, but like you said, there's some real maulers out there on the defensive end, and quarterbacks with the last name Carr are not tending to be very healthy full season. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I really, at this point, I think it's a no-lose situation. Yeah, one I of those agree. super rare no lose loses. You know you're going to be able to sign him to a just stupidly team friendly contract, regardless. Probably above, definitely above vet minimum, but probably not by much. I think you could get him for vet minimum. I was going to say maybe There's... you could, maybe you'd want to be like cool as the Raiders and show some additional money, but I don't think it would take a lot if you're going vet no, minimum. Th- vet minimum would have to be pretty high too, considering um, his years of service. Because doesn't, doesn't it scale? I don't know. I'm not looking it up. It One would matter. think, yeah. I think I, I think it does. I really but don't I'm know. also not looking this up because I don't give a shit. Um, yeah. All right. Let's move on then. Sure. Shout outs to you, Colin Kaepernick. Um, <laughs> by the way, I just checked. Uh, Gary Sanchez WAR this season zero point three, OPS this season of one eleven. Yankees combined catching staff so far with Kyle Higash- Higashioka's negative 0.7 and Jose Trevino's positive 0.7. And that's out to zero. So, yeah, Gary Sanchez would have been a, uh, a net a net ad, net, net positive for the for the Yankees team, especially considering the fact that his OPS is uh, significantly higher. Um, Kyle Higashioka rocking an OPS plus of 25. Nice. And Jose, Jose Trevino managed to scrape it all the way up to a 97 after a handful of really nice games uh, over the weekend. But uh, Sanchez's 111 is still much higher than both of those. Yeah. Love that. So I miss you, Gary. Glad to see you doing well. All right. Uh, so there's a few players worth discussing for sure, but let's, let's start with Aaron judge who has made himself quite the early season case for AL MVP which brings with it both good tidings and concern for Yankee fans. Good tidings because the Yankees haven't had an MVP in a while. I don't even care to look up how long it's been. I can't imagine who it was. It must have must have been like an A-Rod season in like 2006 or some shit like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it'd be great. So it'd be great. It'd be great to have um, the MVP here. And Judge certainly deserved it back in 2017. And as Yankees fans will still much malign, Jose Altuve, 2007 was Alex Rodriguez's last MVP season. I guarantee you that was the last uh, last Yankees MVP season. Uh, but anyways, sure Brooke Gardner didn't win one one of those years? He always wins the Heart and Hustle Award, which is basically the same thing. Um, it's just as valuable. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what he tells his kids anyway. <laughs> so, obviously, that'd be great. Judge deserves it. Uh, he is underappreciated by the league and Yankees fans everywhere. As I pointed out my, to myself, um, when I realized that I didn't realize he had a higher war per 162 than Juan fucking Soto. So, wow. yeah. Um, that's, however, that's fucking insane, actually. Yeah. And I, it's only going to get higher as Aaron Judge continues the stupid good season he's, he started himself off to. Through 41 games, he has almost three war. 2.9 in 41 games. That's a quarter of the season. For those wow. playing at home, that's a 12 war season. Uh, yeah, hot, very hot start to the year, which presents the problem to Yankees fans, which is essentially the Bryce Harper dilemma of a few years ago, which is you have not signed into an extension, which means this is his last year in pinstripes unless you do sign to an extension. You guys couldn't come to an agreement in the offseason because he thought as though you were undervaluing his worth. You thought you were fair. He is now blowing up his own averages for his statistics by massively outperforming them, which means you are going to have to pony up more money because it proved that he was, at least in the short term, right. Now, Yankees have two options. I guess they have three options. 
One, hurry. <laughs> hurry and sign him. And you have the extension done before the season ends. Option two, wait for the season to end. Let him hit free agency and see if by the end of the season, he doesn't cool down or he cools down and maybe levels out his stats a little bit. So he's a little bit more market rate affordable. Uh, and there's not as much of a market in what may be, I don't know, a big hitter class. I genuinely have no fucking clue. I don't care. Option three, trade him. If you have no intention of re-signing him and he's only going to be here for this year, is it worth, as we discussed with Bryce Harper back in the day, is it worth just fucking trading him at the trade deadline? Now, that obviously presents issues. The Yankees would be down a pretty huge bat heading into what could be a big playoff year for them. They're the best record in baseball this season. They are primed to have a good playoff seating, you know, all that type of shit. So obviously losing a giant bat like that would hurt like hell. So you might hang on to him just, you know, to finish out the season, even if you don't want to resign him. But there's also the value proposition of what could you get? Probably a lot. Is it worth mm-hmm. it? Which is crazy to even have to consider because you know what's really sucked for the past several years? The Yankees outfield. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been bad. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been real bad. Look at it now. It's fucking bad right goddamn now. Aaron Hicks has receded into a ghost. I, I mean, it's stunning. Joey Gallo has not panned out to the degree that everyone hoped. I'm not saying he's been truly horrific like a lot of people think. I don't think he's been truly horrific, but he's not been what we thought we were going to get. Who the fuck's our fourth outfielder? Marwin Gonzalez has been playing too much outfield for my liking. So, yeah, I don't think you can afford to be like, Judge, who needs her? Um, it's, it's been perplexing. I don't know. From a, from a distance, what do you think? I think the smart move would be to attempt to sign him as soon as utterly possible because Agreed. I don't think even if he does dip in production over the course of the rest of the season, it's not going to his value isn't going to dip enough to actually change the type of contract he's going to sign. If you're pinching pennies by allowing him to walk into free agency and get a, what is equivalent to the, you know, NBA supermax, you kind of deserve if he leaves and signs a massive contract with someone else, you need to offer him a stupid contract while he's still wearing pinstripes because he is the face of your team and is essentially the Derek Jeter for the 2020s New York Yankees. Uh, I think it would be utterly silly to let a guy like that enter free agency. I without mean, wildly stupid. Without what, yeah. sorry. Without having that control. I, I mean, we've, we've talked, I've ranted about how the Yankees had no good reason to pass up on Manny Machado and how the Yankees had no good reason to pass up on Bryce Harper, especially at Bryce Harper's. And that's the other thing is like Bryce Harper's annual is AAV looked totally fine when he signed that contract. Cause it was like 24.6 a year. Or something. Like it was like under 25 a year. And now it looks so much better. It looks incredible. Who f- fucking cares how much money it takes to sign Aaron judge. What's going to happen if he doesn't, if he doesn't stay, that means that, okay, Stanton has to start playing the outfield every day. It's going to destroy his legs because he has hamstring mm-hmm. problems. Like, it, all right, you know, whatever. It, like, so he's going to be gone more of the season. And then who, who is playing outfield? There's nobody. You got a a a, a band aid in Marvin Gonzalez that is not fixing a lot. Aaron Hicks is unplayable for both his defense and offense now. Uh, I, I, Joey Gallo is probably gone. Falling. If you're not paying, if you're not paying Judge, you're not paying. What are you gonna give us Gallo and call it splitting the difference? Like no, he's just as good. So even even if let's say you got Gallo in left and. Stanton and Wright, and both are the normal versions of themselves and both stay healthy for the year. You still have no center fielder and no fourth outfielder slash DH. And that's a pretty big hole. 
Like I remember everyone else remember the 2015 to 2017, 2018 before they got Stanton when the Yankees DH spot was like equivalent to uh, a pitcher in the national league hitting. Like it was pathetic. It literally cost us playoff games. Like there's no, it will decimate your depth and you'll spend more time, money and resources trying to fill that gap in free agency. than you will. If you just fucking sign judge. Again, you were the New York fucking Yankees. Swing your dick around. Why wouldn't why wouldn't you try to say what what are you going to accomplish by not signing him? What is the advantage you are getting by not signing him to a contract that he he deserves? Look how smart we are. Real fucking smart. Yeah, it's really smart not using your greatest asset to make your team as good as possible. Now, I closed my spot track tab that I had open before today because I was like, ah, I'm not going to go in it every day. And yeah, I'm right back at spot track. Next year, committed to payroll in 2023. How much money do you think is on the Yankees books so far? Uh, this, this includes the $36 million owed to Garrett Cole, the $32 million owed to Giancarlo Stanton, the $21 million owed to Josh Donaldson, 16 to Rizzo, 15 to LeMahieu, 15 to Severino, and 11 to Hicks. How- also, I can't, I can't add all that up. I was, and then you kept adding to it, and I just kind of uh, the RAM that controls my brain just uh, reached its maximum. Uh, 160? 145. Oh, those numbers are really close to adding up to 145, so there can't be really anything else on top of those guys um which yeah. is scary well, because the rest of it's arbitration yeah so if you have on um, you know they got their, their i guess this is the full 40 man i'm looking at now this is still only 26 i'm not gonna count all that shit out but you know let's say you got ah uh, fuck it let's say you got thir- 30 dudes that you gotta pay still and there are average because it's all, you know, it's a whole bunch of spread of different ARB years. Some of these guys are still going to get minimum, blah, 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 blah. So let's average it out to what? Six million, seven million dollars a player, given all the, the big spread in ARB. Some are going to be over that because, you know, like Jordan Montgomery is going to be over that. But Miguel and Duhar will be under that. Clay Holmes will probably be under that. Jonathan, Michael, Michael King's in ARB, his first ARB year. He's getting under that. Let's call, let's call it, let's call it six million dollars. All right. Yeah, that's not it's at we're, yeah, we're, I mean we're we're talking 18 million dollars. Like you fucking just get over it. Right. Just just move, move the fuck on. Just all all together, you're right. At, tack on 20 million dollars just just to, to to round yourself up. You're, you're under 170. Signing judge puts you at 205. You're at 240 something right now. <laughs> It's um, it's kind of ridiculous. I I don't really understand what Hal's end goal is. I I really don't know if he views this purely as a oh well you know this is a business in order to do that you know in order to run a good business we need to cut costs and well labor is always the biggest cost so we could replace him. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. It feels very like I read Moneyball back in 2007. I, I know, you know, you just, we don't, we just need to get the on base and the slugging from other places. We just need to average out all that slugging across the team. I'm really smart. I read Moneyball. And it's like fucking, or you could just get this one guy. You yeah. have, you have, and that's the thing. It's like, all right, you signed Garrett Cole. Amazing. Great. Would you follow that up with the next offseason? Your your fist up your own ass like like you did nothing, and like yeah, so far it's worked out. You know, like the Yankees have the best record in baseball. So far, it's worked out really nice. But it's just a bizarre thing to have to constantly do, where it's like yeah. we'll do this big splashy thing, and show that we will spend money. Oh, but then we gotta pinch our little penny somewhere else. It's not like this is a player who. Looks good on paper, looks good in headlines. Yeah, he's the face of our team, but, you know, from a from a stats perspective, you know, the value isn't quite there. This is Aaron Judge. He is objectively that good and worth that money. 
this is purely a financial penny pitching move, not a sly money ball maneuver to get guys that get on base. Oh, the guys show how fucking smart they are. So fucking mm, smart, guys. A bunch of real yeah. fucking brainiacs. Um, so speaking of Aaron Judge, just to paint a picture of his season, which has been stellar. Uh, he is in the 100th percentile in average exit velocity, hard hit percent, expected weighted on base, expected slugging, and barrel percent. 100th percentile of all of them. Uh, 97th percentile of max exit velocity, 96th percentile of expected batting average. Um, he's above the 50th percentile in everything else other than strikeout percent, where he's in the 23rd percentile. So he strikes out a whole mm. bunch, but who fucking cares? He's uh, he's in the top one to three percent of the league in like everything: exit velocity, max exit velocity, expected batting average, expected slugging, blah blah blah. Like pick, pick your fucking poison. He's 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 crushing it in everything. He is killing the fastball. Expected weighted on base of five forty five this season, which makes uh, sense. He's he's the most fastballs of anything else. Against breaking balls, he is uh, an expected weighted on base of four seventy two. So if you Throw him a breaking ball. He's going to get on base for, for 47% of the time. Um, at off speed is where he struggles the most. 20, uh, 281 expected weighted on base. I expect us to find that to be pretty average. He only whiffs on the fastball 18% of the time. Breaking balls uh, 33% of the time. And off speed pitches 37% of the time. Um, so, again, probably what I one, what one would expect. Um yeah, he ha- oh for his actual stats because I don't think I actually read those yet. His slash line is oh god three fourteen for batting average three fourteen three eighty six uh, six ninety two god damn um just fuck me that's a WRC plus because I'm on Fangraphs today feeling fancy of two ten casual one hundred and ten percent better than league average yeah. Mm-hmm. He's walking 10.7% of the time. Just amazing. Just love it. Uh, his defense has been positive from the general Fangraphs defensive metric that they have here. And again, his war by Fangraphs has been 2.9. He's been outstanding. I, I mean, <laughs> just unreal this year from him, man. Unreal. Do you think the Yankees signed them? Him. Honestly, if I was the Yanks, seven years, thirty-two million a year. What's that total value? Uh, it'd be what two twenty-four. Bargain. Yeah, I mean he's thirty years old. So he'll be 37 by the end of it. But like, who fucking cares? Like, yeah. he's not fast today. He's, he's fast for his size. But he's not like I, he's not like his Tim Anderson out there. You know what I mean? He's not like 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 chugging around the base paths. His power is his strength is his power uh, and his great eye. And mm-hmm. both those things are going to age him pretty well. Like that's what kept, I know Pujols has had some up and down seasons with his ter- time with the Angels, but I mean, that's what kept Pujols playing in his 40s like he is now. You know, those skills, especially the eye being the, the, the big difference maker, like those things will age relatively well. You can just start slotting him into the DH role, bat him forth so that he doesn't have to come up with uh so does it to be on on the bases with a lot of your power hitters up and just start raking in homers, right? It. I hope the Padres sign him to a massive contract. I would hate that so much for me, but he would be so good with that team. Holy shit! I'll be honest. Um, as much as I would love for that to happen, I actually meant to say the Pirates. Oh God, never going to have it. He'd be their entire (laughs) payroll. Exactly. I just would love for the Yankees to get outbid on their franchise player by a team who is 
just that unwilling to pay for anyone. Oh my god, that'd be so fucking funny. It would never, it would never happen. A million years. Mm. But it would be pretty fucking funny. It would be so funny. I would love talking about it. What would you do? Like, all right, really genuine reaction. If the pirates all right, hold on. What's their current payroll for this season? Any guess while I'm looking? No. Oh my god. Oh wait, hold on. Okay. No, that's projected for next year. Okay. 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 Good. 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 You sure you don't want to get a guess in? Uh no. Oh, it's not much better. All right, sixty-seven million dollars. <laughs> oh, jeez. For this year, under seventy mil. What if? What if? What? What would your genuine reaction be if the Pirates went out this off season? They're only slotted. They only have thirty-five million dollars on their books for next season so far. So, what would your reaction be if the, this off season the Pirates spent a hundred and forty million dollars, <laughs> ran a payroll of one seventy, a hundred mil over what they spent last year? And just did everything they could to win the division in as short a period of time as they possibly could. I would be just applauding them for finally doing it. I would be questioning what happened to Bob Nutting, and I would just throw my hands up with the now. So now? that's the thing. I would assume, as happy as I would be, obviously, I would be dying to know who killed Bob Nutting because <laughs> I don't genuinely. I, I would, my gut reaction would go straight into conspiracy theory and that we are experiencing a weekend at Bernie situation because there's no way that man would do it. Rob Manfred would have to hold him at gunpoint. Push the button, Bob. <laughs> Push the button, Bob. Sign the piece of paper, Mr. Nutting. <laughs> I imagine uh, Manfred is a raging psychopath in real life. Oh, he's done nothing to to to, to prove otherwise. So, no. yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I hate it so. Much. So let's look around uh, the AL East real quick because there was a couple other players that are having some disparate starts this season that might be worth talking about. Uh, so let's start with Wander Franco, who was called up by the Rays last year to everyone's thanks because it was time, and we like to see these players get their 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 um. Time in the majors as expediently as possible. Now, when he came up with the Rays last year, he had a really strong um, 70 games. I didn't realize it was that many games. And he came out and he hit 288, 347, 463. That is good for an, an, a WRC plus of 127, so 27% better than average, and a total war in that period of time of 2.4. So played some good defense, played some good offense. Life was groovy. This year, by war, he's not off to a bad start, per se. Uh, he has one war on the season, which in 39 games, like, one war is good. You know, that means that he's on pace for a four-war season, which would be almost an all-star. You know, a couple couple wins off of being an all-star. So that's, that's, that's nice, but it's it's not been on the hitting at all as he's been dropped down to a WRC plus of 101, so essentially league average. He's now hitting... 255, 283, 401. So really the on base just not there. He's being he's only walking 4.2% of the time, which man, that's just not enough. The power is shown a little bit. You know, the 401 slugging is definitely not bad, but he only has four home runs on the season. So I, I mean he's he's getting his, his doubles in, I guess. He's got nine of them, he's got a triple, but the 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 homer isn't there. He hit seven last year, so it wasn't a huge part of his game last year either, but no walks and and it's not really no walks really is huge. There. Yeah. That's 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 ugly. That's uh that's a major red flag if you're not seeing the ball like that. Like if you're swinging, making contact, that's one thing. But if you're not seeing the strike zone, that's it's a big red flag for the future. And and here's the real big difference between last year and, and this year from his batted ball profile. Ground ball percents the same. So last year he was hitting 45.3% ground balls. This year, 45.5% is the same. His fly ball percent is down six points, 34 and a half down to 28 and a half. Now, that's tough because fly balls become home runs. 
you want to hit the ball in the sky. You're never going to hit a ground ball home run. It's Mm -hmm. not going to not going to leave the stadium on the dirt. And some of the other these types of metrics have gone kind of so where has that 6% gone? Part of it's gone in in field fly ball percent, which is notched up over a point and a half, which basically means he's hitting pop ups. He's hitting a ton of pop ups. His home run to fly ball ratio actually managed to go up this year because he's hidden. He's hit so many fewer fly balls that now that he's, you know, some of them have, have been home runs, the ratio goes, goes upwards, but not in a really like good way. Uh, the rest of where those fly balls have come from has actually been line drives, which you might think of as being good, but I would argue that if your line drives are coming away from your fly balls, and not your ground balls, it might not be for the best because that means that your overall launch angle is decreasing, not increasing. Not that you want it to increase forever. Obviously, having a super high um, l- launch angle would be bad. You'd be hitting it straight up in the fucking sky. But right. if your ground, if your fly ball percent is down, all going into line drives, and your ground ball percent didn't move, instead of hitting the ball on average, I don't know, like. N- n- 14 percent or 14 degrees for launch angle which would be pretty okay it might be dropping down to like nine which means you're hitting ground balls all day oh i don't know uh he's a young guy i mean this doesn't mean like it's the end but it's a cold start for sure (laughs) yep number one prospect in baseball into his second season (laughs) i'm confident he'll be able to figure it out but this is just it's not what you would want to see, but of course it's, it doesn't actually matter towards, you know, whether or not he's actually going to pan out. Yeah. Now this is very much so just like, let's check in on, we often talk about guys making their debuts and then it feels like we never talk about them again. <laughs> so yeah. just checking in. Um, yeah, his, his sliders are all over the place in terms of speaking of his baseball savant sliders, average exit velocity, very middle of the pack, 46 percentile max exit velocity, 88 expected batting average, 92. Strikeout percent, 97, doesn't strike out a lot. Whiff percent, 96, does not swing and miss a lot. But barrel percent, 30th. Walk rate, 8th. Chase rate, 21st. So, like, there's good signs here. There's really good, like, the yeah. fact that he doesn't swing and miss is is probably going to lead to some really interesting batting average. Perc- his expected batting average is top 8% in the league, 31, uh, uh, three, 315. But... Right now, it's not translating into a lot of hits or a lot of um, a lot of power because he's not hitting the ball with any force. He's getting the bat to the ball, but he's not driving it. It's interesting that he has such a slow or such a low swing and miss rate and such a low walk rate because he just must not be swinging. He swings and makes contact. And just doesn't swing otherwise. Or he's, what was his chase rate? Uh, his chase rate is the 21st percentile. I'll get you, an, I'll get you so, a number here in a second. He's just make, he just must have a very high I don't, math. I don't know. Uh, chase percent 33, just up from last year's 28 and a half. Yeah. So maybe he just needs to be more selective. He might need to sell out for a little bit more power. Yeah. Because if he's making contact with everything, he might be expanding his own a little bit too much. So his in-zone contact percent is 92.9%. So if you throw the ball in the strike zone and he swings at it, He's going to make contact with it 93% of the time. That's huge. Yeah. His chase contact percent is also pretty fucking high. It's 70.5% of the time. So if you throw the ball out of the strike zone and he swings at it, he's going to hit it 70% of the time. And I I don't know anything. I'm a big fucking (laughs) dummy. But if the power is not there, you might tell him – or some of the, the thinking might be you don't have to hit everything. 
I mean, this is this is the conversation we always have with with guys like, um, of course, they're all in the Yankees now, Giancarlo Stanton, Aaron Judge, and Joey Gallo. Like, yeah, they strike out a ton, but who fucking cares? Because when they hit the they ball, it goes nine hundred feet. Yeah, and and a home run is always going to be significantly more valuable than a strikeout. Like that's the fucking game. It's the fuck you hit one home run and strike out three times. Who gives a shit? If you did that every single game, you would finish the season with 162 home runs. And who cares how many strikeouts you had? Yeah. So. No way. Yeah. I mean, yeah, who knows? This is season two, 40 games in. Could be anything. But yeah, interesting to note. Could be literally anything. Uh, yeah, outs above average, though, that's where uh, he's, he seems to be performing well. 63, 63rd percentile. Um, so not like bad by any stretch of the imagination. Not fantastic, but hey, I'm mean, honestly, I don't think it's a big deal. Obviously, still getting used to um, major league hitting as a as a, a fielder, especially an infielder. I'm sure, that's tough. So, hey, good on him. It seems like he's he's. You know, again, there's some really good indicators here, but so far, a little bit, I don't know, slightly lopsided results here and there. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Uh, the other guy, the other guy, uh, Vlad Guerrero Jr. Kind of a weird year for him based on his batted ball profile that I saw get raised and thought was interesting. So we'll start here, which is that the dude is hitting. That is not the problem. He has a 130 WRC plus. Uh, His defense might be a problem because from that, he only has a 0.7 war. So clearly something else is going wrong with him, but it's not his ability to actually hit. He has uh, eight home runs. Yes. Uh, wait, he has four doubles. That's it. All right, pick up the legs, my friend. Um, twenty walks, three of which were intentional. Uh, he, he, he started off his season nice. His, his slash line is two sixty three, three fifty six, four four forty seven. Uh, really, oh, his base running is negative one point nine. I can tell based on the doubles. I didn't even need to see it. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's no good. It's no good, my friend. Um, but now uh, check this out. So we just raised the issue with Wander Franco about his ground ball and fly ball ratios. Uh, Vlad Guerrero heading in so far this season, 2021 fly ball percent, 36 and a half. This season is down seven percentage points to 29.6. And where is that 7% going? Almost exclusively two ground balls it is going from 44.8% in 2021 to 51.2% 2022 which means if Vlad Guerrero hits a ball makes contact with a baseball it is going on the ground 51% of the time that's rough his line drive percent ticked up a half a point from last year that's just the account for the other missing percentages and the fly ball ratio going fly ball percent going down infield fly ball percent went up three points. Also a, a pretty big difference here in these stats, but man, it's an ugly batted ball profile. Ugly. Yeah, that's, that is absolutely not something you would want to see. Like we just talked about how, what we saw from Wander Franco isn't something that we want to see. From a young player, that's not something that's going to be a, uh, or those are red flags. That 51% is a major red flag. Now he's getting away with it a lot because he smacks the shit out of the baseball. In 2022, his, uh, his average exit velocity is 93.6, which is top 3% in the league and his second best of his career. And his max exit velocity is 119.9, top 1% of the league, and the best of his career, uh, not counting his brief rookie campaign. He's in the 
top 3% in the league in average exit velocity, max exit velocity, hard hit percent. Um, he's in the top 10% in the league in expected weighted on base, expected batting average, and expected slugging percent. But those are pretty reliant based on the fact that he smacks the shit out of the ball. The problem is smacking the shit out of the ball in the air will lead to eventually a lot of home runs and some good doubles. Smacking the shit out of the ball on the ground will eventually lead to better defensive positioning. That leads to you, Mr. Not Very Fast Man, making outs to first a lot. That's my concern with down the stretch or second half, Vlad, that I, that, uh, I saw get raised by somebody else. I didn't just notice this, um, but it is interesting. Because it's like, it's like the opposite of what we talked about for the Mets. The Mets were like hitting the ball soft as possibly could be, but just finding every hole in existence. And so even though they, their expected stats were like kind of shitty, they were scoring a bunch of runs and winning a bunch of games. And that's held up. They're still doing it. Um, it almost feels like Vlad's primed for the opposite. It, it, it's, it's tough to say, obviously. I mean, but that, that fly ball ratio or percent dropping so much. Not good. Not good. Not good, Jim. Not good. And as crazy as it is to say with the 130 WRC plus, it is 30 points lower than where he was last year. He's a really good baseball player. He is, but it makes you wonder where is, where is he going to end up? That's what I'm so curious about. All right, slow your roll. (laughs) Like, slow down. He has has a career six war. Sorry, seven war. Let's slow down. Um, But his WRC plus by season, 105, 110, 166, and 130. So really all over the place. And he's played pretty much full seasons in all of those years. So tough to discount any of them. Uh, And he's shifted from being third base to first base, which obviously greatly affected his ability to accumulate DWAR. And he's been bad at first base, which has also affected him. It's he's such an interesting player because it feels like all the tools are kind of there, but they haven't all been there at the same time. Or they, they haven't, like, congealed yet. Like, he can hit the ball fucking hard. I know he can hit for a higher average. He's done it. He, his average was 311 last year. Um, you know he can play better defense. He was a third baseman. Like, he can definitely play better D than he is at, at first base. Like, there's all these... He's never going to be fast. It's just It's never going to be fast. <laughs> um, but there's all these tools that are, like, obviously there in him, but haven't all... Like outside of last year, they haven't all gotten there yet. Again, I have almost zero worry for the future of Vlad Guerrero Jr. He is 23. Yeah. Yeah. And even talking about those all over the place WRC plus numbers, it's all trending upward. Like, yes, it's a dip from last year, but he was playing at an MVP front runner essentially would have won if not for the literal reincarnation of Babe Ruth coming back to play baseball. Yeah. Yeah. No, not, not where, cause that's the thing. Most players don't have even the flashes or not even flashes. I don't want to get sound so short term, the clear presence of these skills. Most players don't even have that. Vlad has them. It's just, I think we all collectively got very excited that he was going to come up and be be his potential immediately. And it's interesting because I don't think he has. As good as he has been, and as good as I think he still will be, I'm not, again, neither of us are sitting here and saying, fucking bust. Um, but, like, I don't think he has yet been the guy that he can be. Even last year, I think he can. I think no. he can be better. He had a really good season last year. I really think he can be better than that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, better than the best is 
a hard thing to say so definitively, but yeah, I mean, him doing that consistently would, I think in my mind, quantify being better than that, because if that's your baseline, you can have a fucking unbelievable ceiling. Uh, he has it. He's got it in him. I refuse to believe that Vlad Guerrero's peak is a 6.3 war season. Refuse right. to believe that. It's going That's to be just silly. I don't know how his war was that low when he put up the numbers he did. Horrible defensive base running. Okay. That's, that's from, like, you, dude, you came up as a third baseman. I know you can pick it. Like, I know you can. You don't even have to throw. I know you can pick it. So, yeah. All right. Well, hey, uh, we've been going for a while. You want to wrap it up here? Yep. All right. Well, and if you want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do so at Juicing Pod. Like to follow Corwin on Twitter, you can do so at Corwin Hell. If you like to follow myself on Twitter, you can do so at Joshua D. Tracy. If you'd like to send emails to the show, you can do so at juicing the numbers at gmail.com. And until Monday, y'all have a good one. Bye.